All right, there we go. Recording should be going. Um, so yeah, welcome everyone to this, the last workshop of the fall semester. Um, it's been a long one, I'm sure, for everyone, uh, but this is it. We all get a break after this. We get our Monday evenings back. So this is going to be a workshop on the fundamentals of curb roasting. That's what I've called the workshop. Uh, the idea behind it is to actually teach you the basics of what Kerberos is and how it can be abused in some ways. Uh, so there's the attendance link. We've already looked at that. Hopefully everyone signed the attendance. Remember, it's mandatory for club executives to sign. And for everyone else, uh, attendance, uh, attending at least half the workshops gets you uh, full membership, voting membership in the club to vote on executives and help determine the future of where the club goes. It's really important to stay involved because it's what keeps the club going. So an outline of what we're going to be doing tonight. Um, we're going to start with Active Directory basics. So going over what Active Directory is, uh, how it works. Understanding that is important for understanding why, uh, how the Kerberos protocol is implemented, why it's implemented, what it's doing in the background. After that, we're going to do some user enumeration uh, against Active Directory services or Windows services. Then we're going to do ASREP roasting, followed by Kerber roasting, and then dumping secrets from a machine after we've escalated our privileges. The tools you're going to need for this are Impacket, SMB Map, and SMB Client. SMB Map and SMB Client come with Kali. I believe Impacket comes with Kali but I couldn't quite get it working on my version, so I asked people to download it. Um, and then that's probably, and that, that's actually not gonna be necessary. You're not going to use the version that you downloaded, and I'll show you why soon. Um, our goal tonight is to understand Kerberos, then understand what Kerberosting is, and then understand the weaknesses in Kerberos and, and what we've exploited. And the reason that we're going to do this uh, is because th sometime during the summer, maybe the end of the school year last year, uh, Alex and I had a meeting with someone at a, I'd say a small to medium sized uh, cybersecurity firm here in Calgary. And we asked him, what are things that you wished people knew or, or that people don't seem to know? And he told us that one of the big weaknesses he finds for people coming out of both the U of C and SAIT is that we don't understand how Windows systems work internally, specifically Windows networks, and, and then he singled out uh, Windows Active Directory. It's what's used by most big companies, uh, universities, hospitals, any large organization that has a big computer network somehow is organizing that, and it's usually, uh, it's usually Windows uh, Active Directory. So he said he thought it would be good if we knew more about that, and then... Sorry, Kyle, I'm just going to mute you. <laughs> um, he said he thought it would be good if we knew more about that. And then he said not only sort of knowing what it is and, and how to, to attack it, but also really understanding how the attack works. When he is trying to hire people for pen testing positions at his company specifically, uh, he will give them something to pen test. And it likely involves something that, that uses Kerberos. And he said, a lot of people can do the attack and execute the attack, but when he asks them what the attack did, they, they fall apart immediately. And essentially what they know is how to use the tools available to them, but they're not really sure what the tools are doing. They're not confident on what the tools are doing. And he, does, he doesn't want what we'll call a script kitty, someone who just knows how to use a bunch of tools. He wants someone who understands fundamentally what's happening, because that's the person that's going to be able to exploit more. So. The goal here tonight is to familiarize you with Active Directory, Kerberos, and Kerberosting. But by the end of this, I want you to know not only the tools that we use to do it, but understand what those tools were doing internally. Uh, because we want to do more than just use a bunch of tools and, and get into machines. It's about more than that. So those are our goals tonight. At the end of this, I'm going to warn you, you are not going to be a Kerberos expert. You are not going to be able to go out and break into any Windows machine that's out there. Um, this is supposed to be a starting ground. As with all of our workshops, these are supposed to sort of bootstrap you and get you, get you sort of understanding what's happening underneath the hood and understanding the basics. If you want to get good at this stuff, you're always going to have to practice on your own. I say that because the feedback we got at one of our workshops was that some of the stuff that we teach feels sort of gimmicky, like we're just teaching some obvious or, or, or something obvious, or we're just teaching tricks 
that are out there. Um, I'll say that that's, that's probably true for some of the things that we do. Uh, a lot of things rely on misconfigurations that exist and we're just exploiting those misconfigurations. The problem is they have to, they have to be misconfigured in the first place. Um, I, I think that's a valid critique, but I would say that this person, the person that said this, maybe in their mind hacking was, was like, you know, breaking into machines using just pure genius and skill. Uh, most machines aren't vulnerable to that, and that tends to rely on a lot of talent. So yeah, we teach these basics and these fundamental things, and at the end of this, I hope you have an understanding of what this is, and if you want to go learn more, you'll definitely have uh, a step up on anyone who's starting starting fresh, or if you ever see Kerber roasting again, you think back and you go, okay, I kind of remember what was going on here. It's these things being passed back and forth, and we're sort of looking for this and attacking this. That's the idea. So that's the goal tonight. That's, that's what I want you guys to get out of this. That was a long-winded talk. So uh, moving along, we always do useful courses uh, for this topic are going to include uh, Computer Science 441, the Computer Networks course, just understanding networking fundamentals and how things work uh, for communications between computers is nice. Uh, Computer Science 418, the intro to cryptography. I am going to be very loosely using terms like symmetric key cryptography, and I'm going to sort of assume that everybody understands what that is. It, taking this course is great. Uh, this is a, also just a great course at the university. And finally, Computer Science 526, which is Network System Security. There is an entire class, maybe one or two, on the topic of Kerberos and the Kerberos protocol and then how to attack it. Um, it's taught by Dr. Reardon. Here's two slides from, from his class on it. As you can see, he takes a very sort of I would say like mathematical approach. There's diagrams. He's telling you everything that's going back and forth. Uh, this is a full technical overview of what is going on inside of Kerberos. We aren't doing that tonight. I want you to make. Sh I want you to sort of understand the basics of what's going on. If you do this workshop and then take his class, you should really understand what he what he presents in there because you'll understand the fundamentals. You'll start to you'll start to see what exactly is being passed in, the values, how they're hashed, how they're encrypted. Um, but it's a good course. If you find any of this interesting, that course is, is definitely a good one to take. It's one of the great security courses that we have at the U of C, a fourth year course, of course. So um, we're gonna start out with the basics of what Active Directory is. And so let's imagine we have a large organization with a whole lot of people. They wanna use computers. Uh, that's fine. We, we've seen organizations like this. Uh, so let's build a sort of system that a whole bunch of people would use we're going to add some servers onto this system. We're going to add some printers. There are some databases and there are some computers. Um, everybody here wants to be able to access this system. The problem is that, as we know, only certain people should be able to access certain things in the system. Not everybody should be able to log on to every computer. Not everybody should be able to print to every printer. If you think about the university, when you go to the computer science labs or the library there, you can print to computer, or you can print to printers in the labs or in the library, but you can't print to a printer that's I don't know in the the philosophy department or uh, sitting in some professor's office. So there's some controls that are going on there. And what's controlling that is Microsoft Active Directory, the thing that we're we're sort of overarchingly interested in. So what is Active Directory? Well, it's a directory service for Windows. Uh, directory service just meaning that it controls a whole bunch of things inside of a network. Um, and those things can be computers, they can be objects like printers or scanners, um, they can be users, uh, they can be programs and processes. Uh, it, it has identifiers for all of these and it sorts and organizes them and gives them permissions and figure out, figures out who can do what and where. Primarily, it's responsible for authentication and authorization inside of the system. And just a reminder, authentication is making sure you are who you say you are. And authorization is allowing you or denying you access to stuff. So it makes sure that you are the person that you're pretending to be or who you are and gives you access to whatever it is you're supposed to have access to and also prevents you from accessing other things. The main way that it does this is with a computer on the system, on, with a server on that system called a domain controller. And the domain controller is the thing that sort of orchestrates and runs everything centrally inside of Active Directory. 
And we're going to see an example of this later. Um, an Active Directory, just for your information, uses um, the lightweight, lightweight Directory Access Protocol, also called LDAP. You're going to see that probably in the future. You'll see people talking about LDAP, or you'll be signing into something, and it'll, you'll see in brackets LDAP. Uh, all it is is a way to control uh, access, and it's used in sort of authentication systems. Um, so if this one uses it, that's what it is. The domain name system, so it uses DNS, it manages connections and internal networks, and then it also uses the Microsoft implementation of Kerberos. Kerberos, the reason that we came here. Just a quick note that we did a workshop last year on uh, Active Directory attacks, and in that one we used Azure Active Directory, and Azure Active Directory is not the same as Active Directory, as Microsoft Active Directory. Those are two separate things. The Azure one is their cloud version of Active Directory. We're just talking about the straight Microsoft Active Directory, which is the sort of thing that you would have uh, on premise. This is the not cloud version of Active Directory. So a university, a hospital, a large company, if they have their own servers inside the company, they're likely running with Microsoft Active Directory. These two things can talk to each other. The cloud version can talk to the on-premise version, uh, but they are different in a bunch of ways. They do, they do a bunch of different things. So we're just dealing with Active Directory, the one that would be running on a machine on-premise usually. So let's go back to our example. We've got all of this stuff. And let's imagine that uh, we want to figure out how who accesses what. Now, the naive way of doing this would be to tell each thing in the system, each thing on the domain or the network, uh, just give it the username and password for whatever user is allowed to access it. So let's pretend you're allowed to access everything in this, this network right now. We would give it to every single machine. But you probably see pretty quickly there are some problems here, some really practical problems, like what happens if a user wants to change their password? Then you have to go to every single thing in the network and change the passwords on all of them. This also presents a bit of a security problem because uh, what happens if somebody breaks into, get my laser pointer out here, breaks into, let's say, this printer over here. Um, they would get all the usernames and passwords that are available on that printer. And the security on the printer is probably nowhere near as good as it is for something like a server or a database. So this is a pretty weak system. It also doesn't work very well in practice. And the way that we get around this is we can use Active Directory to sort of manage who gets what, when, how, and why. It's going to do all of this orchestration. And the way it's one of the ways it's going to do that, the primary way it's going to do that, is by using Kerberos, the reason that we're all here. So Kerberos is just a protocol. It is very simply just a series of steps that is supposed to authenticate someone and give them access to things. It does that authentication and authorization stuff. So it's it's literally just a series of steps. The, the, the user does this, the server does this, then the, the client does this, the server does this, and they send these things back and forth. So it just specifies the steps to take in order to authenticate and authorize on a system. Um, fun facts, it was developed in the 1980s. The original version was written in C. It's actually a surprisingly small program uh, itself. It's uh, it's pretty old, so it's been around for a long time, although it's, it's still used in a lot of places. And the whole idea of Kerberos is that instead of sending everything out to all of the machines, all those usernames and passwords, that you can put it all on one machine that will act as a central server and uh, like what we like to call a trusted third party. So all of those machines are instead going to rely on one computer or one process that's going to vouch for everything in the system. Everything will be controlled from one spot. It does this by using these things called tickets. We're going to see lots of tickets later on. Uh, just remember that it uses tickets. And one of the principles of Kerberos is that you make the client, the person that's trying to access the system, do as much of the work as possible. And this is important because imagine a place like the university, there's tens of thousands of people that work and use the university's computer systems. Every day they are logging on, they're asking for things, they're printing, they're, they're accessing all kinds of things on the network. If there was just one machine that was controlling what they did and whether or not they could do it, it would put a ton of stress on that machine. So the Kerberos protocol was written to make the client, the person that's requesting things, 
do as much of the processing as it can before it sends anything off to the server. And you'll, you'll sort of see how it does that later. Um, so yeah, this takes the load off that, that central server or that domain controller. And the protocol has a couple of benefits, that it's a couple of problems that it solves. So uh, there's mutual authentication of the user and the server. When I send something to a Kerberos server, I can be sure that it's the Kerberos server that I'm talking to, and it can be sure that I'm the one that's talking to it based on how the protocol works. It also protects against eavesdropping. So if someone's listening into the communication, they're not going to get much because there's symmetric key cryptography that is in place. And we'll see more about that later as well. Um, and it protects against replay attacks. So if you are listening to a message that I send to the server, you can't copy it and then 20 minutes later, send it back to the server. Um, it protects against that. So instead of our system here with the passwords and usernames out all over the place, we're going to put Kerberos, uh, the Kerberos protocol into Active Directory, and we're going to move all those username and passwords into one spot. And whereas before I said the vulnerability was that the username and password was on every machine and, and only one of those things needed to be breached, you're going to look at me and say, well, now you've put all your eggs in one basket. Your username and password is on one machine now, Jeremy. All I have to do is get into that machine. And you're right, that is that is a problem with this system. The idea, though, is that you protect this machine very, very well. It's a little easier to keep it safe if it's in one spot versus if it's sent out all over the place to a bunch of machines that you can't necessarily control. Uh, so this has benefits and drawbacks, which we'll see in a little while. So the design of this workshop and I'm sorry, I need to just restart this because I've lost my presenter view with my notes. There we go. Um, so the design of this workshop, I just want to sort of tell you how I've set this up. Um, instead of using your Kali, and, and you can still use your Kali if you'd like, to do this, you're going to be connecting to a Kali virtual machine that is running on AWS up in the cloud. Um, and that Kali machine is connected to a small virtual network that I've set up where there are other virtual machines that are running and they're all networked together. And this system is set up to be an active directory system. So you're going to connect to a Kali machine and it is networked and connected up with some uh, active directory computers and we're going to be attacking those. Uh, each step in this workshop is going to emulate an attack against uh, an Active Directory system. So we're going to be talking about it, but you're actually going to be trying it and seeing what it looks like. Uh, things I want you to do are to pretend that this is a pen test. So I want you to take notes on what we're doing. You're going to get usernames. You're going to get passwords. You're going to get hashes. Take note of them, because they're, you're going to need them again a little later. Um, also, don't do anything screwy or anything malicious on the server. I didn't put a lot of protections in place on your accounts because I trust all of you guys. Uh, so please don't do any dastardly things against the machine. Um, and yes, I wanted to, it popped up, but I just wanted to say that uh, the design of this whole lab, this is, this is all running in the cloud. The design of it is thanks to this group called MDSEC. They do training. They built a virtual Windows attack environment and made it publicly available and wrote a really nice post about how they did it. And then the person I really want to thank is this person here, Phil Keeble, uh, a red teamer, pen tester, who wrote a blog post on that lab and in more depth explained everything that was going on. And it was his write-up that really allowed me to get this up and, and running. So thank you to those people out there on the internet. So without uh, further ado, I've been talking for like almost 20 minutes now. It's been a while. I want you guys to connect to the machines. Um, we are going to need a account number or an account to connect to it. So uh, right here is the IP address and I need to give you your username. So I'm just going to go through the list here. Uh, your username is going to be account and then a number. So all lowercase. Uh, like, for example, account 35. Um, I'm just going to assign numbers out. Amina, you'll be account 5. Brayden, you will be account 6. Dalara, you will be account 7. Ijaz, account 8. Ethan, account 9. James, account 10. 
uh, Josh, account 11, and Ned, account 12. So go ahead and try to log in using SSH. The password is right here, Magpies Rock with a capital M and a capital R. And let me know if any of you have any problems and feel free to unmute. Is anyone on? Is anyone off? Uh, I just connected. I'm in. Okay. I am also in. All right, good. So uh, what you are now connected to is a virtual machine running Kali, and you have an account on this machine. Uh, Impacket is installed on here. The Rocky text list is unzipped and available to you, and we're going to be using all of those um, in the workshop. So to start out, um, I want you to scan. There's two IP addresses here. These are internal IP addresses uh, for this network that you're on. Well, one of these is a domain controller, and one of them is not. And I want you to see if you can figure out which one is the domain controller. Heads up, when we tested this, these nmap scans could take quite a while. So here's, here's an nmap command down here. This should run it. It should uh, do everything that you need. But uh, these scans hung for a while when we did this with like two or three people. I'm not sure how long they're going to take for you guys. I'm just going to go ahead and do one myself. This is the part of the workshop I think I was most worried about. I'm worried that the machine that we're on might be a little slow. I'm a little worried that the machine this, that we're pinging might freak out or Amazon might freak out and all the traffic we're suddenly throwing at these things. I'm not sure how they're going to react. Um, if, like me, you're running this, you might see that your scan gets stuck at, I believe it's 91.67. Yeah, I've got it here. 91.67%. Ah, nice. Josh got his back pretty quickly. I I have that text exactly. <laughs> I also have that. <laughs> yep. So when we did this yesterday, a bunch of them got stuck at 91.67%. Um, and th what I love about this, if you look, my time remaining is actually going up, though the percentage isn't changing. Um, uh I think your account 12. And let me just go back and get the IP address for you there. Okay, and feel free to toss out any guesses on what the domain control, which one is the domain controller and which one is not. Still hanging for anyone or for everyone, perhaps? Oh good, my scan is 100% done. <laughs> There we go. So my first one just came back. And let me 
me run the second one, but I'm going to move on here in a second. So we've got a lot to do tonight, and we can't wait for Nmap. Can we just, like, toss in our answer, like, here? Can yeah, I you can just, just, say it, just say it out loud. <laughs> yeah, I think it's the second one just because of, like, the SSL certificate. Oh, well, I saw an SSL. The second, the second <laughs> one on. is, is which one? The dot fifty or the dot one hundred? Yeah, dot fifty. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Uh, for Ned, that is the username for account twelve. The the username is account twelve. I'll I'll DM you the. The stuff. Um, anyone else? Any guesses? No? I'm going to move on here in a second, then. Uh, Delara, I thank you for your bravery well, in answering. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I I take it back. I do think it's the first one now. <laughs> okay. Uh, the answers just came in. Like, the scan just came in. Um, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Delara, <laughs> Delara gets it. Maybe not everyone got their scans back. Um, but the answer is that the first one is a domain controller. And the second one is just a server on that domain. And we'll take a look and see why. So your, your scans are probably still coming in, but I've, I've got them here. So this is the scan for the dot .50 machine. This is just the server that's on the domain. Here's the ports that are open. Uh, understanding these ports is important for, for talking about an Active Directory system. It should be pretty obvious that we're dealing with some sort of Microsoft Windows system because the versions here are all Microsoft Windows based. But what are these exactly? Uh, well, the first two and the third one all deal with file sharing. They deal with either literally file shares, uh, exchange shares, um, or things that the, the Windows system is doing to share files. Uh, 445 is, I believe, SMB, where it's it's actually sharing, sharing files. Um, 3389 for future reference is the Windows Remote Desktop Protocol. When you see this, uh, this could be exciting. This could be something that you could try to connect to on this machine. Of course, it's likely going to ask you for a username and password. If you don't have one of those, you can't get in. But if you ever see that on a Windows machine that you're supposed to be attacking, uh, that could be good for you. Other things to notice are we can get some information on what the domain name is for the system that we're on. So we can see here DNS domain name uh, first dot local. This is important. This is one of those things you want to jot down. Uh, this is the name of the domain and we're going to have to use that in the future. So first dot local is important. Uh, we also get a bunch of other information here. That's not what we're interested in right now. The next machine, the dot 100 machine, the second one, this is what comes back on that one. And Delara got her scan back and immediately switched her answer. And it's probably because she saw things like Kerberos is running on this machine, the thing that we've said runs on the domain controller that deals with authentication and authorization. Um, it's also running LDAP, that thing that I mentioned before. And this is all important. Sorry, I've lost my presenter's notes again. Uh, this is all important because these things tell us about what is running on this machine and what kind of machine it is. Uh, so notes, uh, port 53, it deals with the domain name system that we said runs on the domain controller. Port 88 and 464, this one down here, both deal with Kerberos. Uh, we know that these two here deal with some sort of file sharing or exchange, so does 445. Uh, 389 deals with LDAP, 3268 is LDAP. Uh, fun note, 3389 is also running on this machine. This is a domain controller that you can remotely connect to if you have credentials. So that could be a way that we could attack this system. But if you were enumerating and trying to attack this system, these would be things that you would want to take note of. Uh, you would want to keep these Nmap scans, of course. I think almost everyone here is, has done a couple of these scans. These are all important. So before we go on, uh, let's start looking at the Kerberos protocol itself. So this is where I'm going to explain to you exactly what is going on in the Kerberos protocol. Sorry, I say exact, not exact. I am going to uh, generalize some of these steps. 
I am not going to explain what is inside each of the messages. If you want to know that, like I said, take Computer Science 526. Uh, Dr. Reardon goes through all of that. Even the Wikipedia article for the Kerberos protocol has a nice diagram that explains to you uh, everything that's sent and the pieces of the messages inside. But uh, this is going to be the setup for our system. So this is going to be somewhat similar to the system that we have, the network that we're on right now. You have your client, your Kali attack machine. This over here is going to be a file server. So that user server, that, that dot five zero machine that we end mapped, that's going to be this machine over here, something like this machine over here. Um, and then this thing is that says key distribution center is going to be our domain controller. So uh, this, this thing this, that runs the Kerberos protocol is usually called the key distribution center. It's actually two separate processes, two, two programs running. One of them deals with authenticating you and the other one deals with giving out tickets. We're gonna gloss over that and sort of put them, all to, put them both together and pretend that they're just one machine that we're talking to. We're, we're not gonna to care tonight which one of those two processes we're talking to. Uh, enough to say that when we talk to it, stuff happens on its side and it sends stuff back. Another thing to notice is that these, uh, sorry, these keys here are going to represent passwords or tokens or certificates or something that's unique to that, that machine or that process or that user that identifies them. For you, it's probably going to be a password. When you try to, to connect, you're going to use a password. For this file server over here that's set up by the computer, this might be a password. It might also be some sort of certificate. It's probably very long. Uh, it's computer generated and it's switched up every once in a while. That'll, we'll come back to that later. So notice that this system has already been set up and the key distribution center has the keys or passwords for both of you, uh, for both you and that file server. Uh, this, this third key here, the blue one, is going to be the password or the key for the key distribution center. So this is important because now we're going to step into that, that uh, symmetric key cryptography and to start out to get onto this system you are going to send an authenticator using your password as the key so the authenticator is just a message to the key distribution center saying hey i'm a user on this system and i want to get onto the network i want to get into the domain just to authenticate to be on here and be able to use things you send a message that includes some information and that message is encrypted using your password. The password is not sent in the message. The message is encrypted with the password and it's symmetric. So uh, like the XOR function, if you XOR something with its, uh, if you XOR something with the same value twice, it just turns into the original value. Uh, that's, that's what's going to happen here. So we're going to send a message and we're going to encrypt it using our key. And we're going to send that message that's encrypted with our key over to the key distribution center, to the domain controller. And it's going to get that. And because it has our password, it can decrypt it with our password. Remember, the key can encrypt and decrypt it, the same key. So it's going to decrypt it and look at the message. And it's going to say that if you are who you say you are, the only way that message is going to decrypt properly is if you used the password to encrypt it. So when it does this decryption, this is one of the ways that it guarantees that you are who you say you are. Because if you use the right password, then you must be that right, you must be that person. That, that password should be unique to you. So it's going to decrypt it and say, okay, you are who you say you are. Then what it does is it generates a ticket. This is the first ticket we're going to see. And this ticket is confusingly called a ticket granting ticket. I hate this title. It has the word ticket in it twice and it's only three words long. Uh, but it generates a ticket granting ticket. This is generated by the key distribution center and it encrypts it with its own key. And then it sends that back to you. And you hold it in this area here called the Kerberos tray. That's just your RAM. It just sits in memory. Uh, the important thing to note is that it sent you this ticket and it's been encrypted with the, the key from the domain controller here from the key distribution center you can't really read this. It's just an encrypted message. So you don't know what's in there. So now you've been authenticated into the system. You've sent something. It said, okay, you are who you say you are. And here's a ticket to prove that you've been authenticated. 
Now what you're going to do is you're going to say, I want to access the file server, but you can't talk to the file server right now because you'll notice that you guys don't have anything really in common. It's got a green key, you've got a pink key. Um, you don't have anything in common, so the, the thing you do is instead you go to the domain controller and you say, you send a message that says, I want to access the file server. And you send a message saying, I want to access the file server, and here's that ticket granting ticket you sent me earlier, so you know that I, I'm allowed in the system. You only sent me this because I was allowed in the system. And so the domain controller gets that, unlocks it. If it's right, it's going gonna, it's gonna to decrypt properly. It does. So then the domain controller sends a ticket back, and this is called a ticket granting service. Um, and it sends, and, and this is a ticket granting service that is specific to that file server. So this ticket is only going to work with this file server over here. And it encrypts that ticket with the password or with the key for the file server. So you can't use this to go send it to some other service on the domain because it's not going to be encrypted with the right password or, or the right key. And it sends this back to you. So this blue ticket here allows you to get stuff, get, get other tickets from the domain controller and says that you're supposed to be on the system. This green ticket now is only useful if you want to talk to the file server. So now what you do is you send something to the file server, it gets that message, it decrypts it using its key, and it's the key works, and this is, this is important. The file server is able to decrypt this ticket. You have not sent your password over there, but it says, Look, if you got this ticket, it's because it's only because the domain controller gave it to you. And the domain controller trusts you, so I can trust you. This is what that trusted third party is that's, that's here in the middle. An important thing to note is that none of these keys are ever actually sent um, in any of these, these communications. They're just encrypting the things that are being sent. So that's important to understand as well. Any questions right now on the Kerberos protocol? Anything anyone's confused about? And Kyle, I'm gonna I'm gonna manually unmute you here. Um, anything? Anyone? Everyone's good. Everyone's feeling comfortable with this. It's like I said, it's more complicated under the hood, but this is essentially what's going on. We're gonna go back through this a few times to understand ways that we can abuse this. So yeah, now we're talking to the file server. So we want to be able to attack this system, the system that is using this protocol to communicate with, with machines and with services and with accounts back and forth. The problem is that we don't have any credentials in this system. And as you saw, this all works using passwords and, and credentials. We don't have any of those. We need to somehow figure out how to start weaseling our way into this system the first thing we should do is start trying to figure out if there are users that we can we can get from the system. So step one in our workshop tonight is going to be user enumeration. And there are some possible methods of doing this. Uh, one is to brute force uh, users. There are tools and programs out there. I think Kerbrute is a popular one, and it does a lot of brute forcing. The trouble with that is it's very loud. The the system will be able to notice that somebody is just sending lots of traffic and lots of traffic that's failing to pass any authentications. Um, we don't want to do that. That's sort of a last resort. That's going to get noticed. Uh, instead, we're going to use this, this method, the SMB anonymous access method. So um, SMB is a way to, is used for sharing files across Windows machines. And we're going to use uh, two tools to take a look at it, SMB client and SMB map. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you have used this if you've done any try hack me over the summer. I know we used it a lot in try hack me over the summer. It's used a lot in our King of the Hill bot, uh, machines that we we were playing games on. So uh, first, just take a look at what's available on these machines using SMB client. So here's the command up here, SMB client uh, tac l four backslashes, the IP of the address at the IP address of the machine, and then slash slash, and then n. And the attack n field is going to suppress the password prompt. So that just means it's going to try to connect with no password. What this, is, what this should do is tell you if anything is available to you on the system. 
So go ahead and give that a try. This is available on those Kali machines that you've connected to. Uh, go ahead and run that for both of them and see what you get as output. I'm going to go ahead and run it myself. Sorry, on another screen. Let me know if anyone has any problems. Okay. Anyone need more time? Everyone's taking taking a look at what they've got there. I'm just going to show you on Uh, I'm going to show you on my screen what it looks like. Uh, so this is the the SMB client run both times, once against the user server and once against the domain controller. And as you can see, anonymous logon was successful on the domain controller, but uh, it looks like it's disabled. There's nothing in there that's being shared. Um, on the user server, though, it's telling us some stuff. So what these are are uh, folders that are being shared within the system. Uh, there's one here called public files. I want you to go ahead and run this again. Uh, this, What we could do here is try to connect to each one of these individually, but that's not super useful at this point. What we want to do is know what we could we could connect to. Uh, so you can do that using SMB map. So try this command, SMB map tac h for host, then the IP address of the machine, and then tack U for anonymous to see if you can connect anonymously. And what this is going to do is spit out some information about that machine. Move this out of the way again. What this is going to do is spit out some information about those shares and what's available to you. So I'm going to go ahead and run it here on the side while you guys are doing that. Got some stuff back. Right, I'm gonna go ahead and show you what I've got. Um, it's pretty similar, pretty much the same thing. We see that there's an authentication error on the domain controller for the anonymous user. Doesn't doesn't want to show us anything as anonymous, but on the file server, it is showing us stuff. So it's showing us that it found something at IP address 445. We saw that on our Nmap scan. So this is this is the port that this stuff is being shared over. And this is similar to our previous output, except this time we can see the permissions. And if there were multiple things here, uh, this would be useful. Uh, if there were more than like four things and you had to try connecting them one at a time, it could get a little tedious. SMB map just shows us what the permissions are for these. Uh, so I'm gonna tell you right now, this public files thing is what we're interested in. And it's marked currently as read only. Uh, so back to our slides. Yeah, that's what the SMB map looks like. Um, so we could go ahead and try to connect to that public files as anonymous uh, if we wanted to. But what we're going to do instead is we're going to actually, I'm sorry, let me show you. This is something that I wanted to do with this workshop. I'm going to show you what this looks like on the Windows side. So. I'm going to remotely connect. Those remote desktop connections that were available on the ports is actually me opening those up so I can show you what this looks like from the Windows side. Because you're just working in a terminal. You're going to say this is all very abstract. Uh, what this looks like on the Windows side, so this, this is that file server computer. I've just remotely connected to it using this tool, uh, Ramina, which I really like. Um, on the C drive here, there are some folders. There's one here called public files. And if I right click on it and go to properties, I can go to sharing and advanced sharing. And I've clicked on share this folder. So it's sharing it. When I click on permissions, uh, we see that permissions are granted to everyone, administrators and anonymous login, uh, logon. So someone has said that the anonymous logon uh, account is allowed to access to this. 
and I believe it's also been granted in the security folder. Yeah, this person has been granted read uh, list and read uh, permissions on on this thing. So that's good for us. Someone has set up a folder that is publicly available to just an anonymous user, and now we're in. So that's what it looks like. That's how it was configured on the Windows side. Back to back here. Um, we would be able to connect to this anonymously. Uh, let me see if I still have. We could use SMB client to do this. Sorry, I think I accidentally deleted the slide with this command on it, so I'll show you what it looks like as long as I can get it to work. Uh, oh, right, I'm on the wrong machine. Come on. Sorry, guys. Ugh, it's not working. Um, Okay, <laughs> um, that's not working. Sorry, I've lost the command that I used. If anyone knows it off the top of their head, by all means, go ahead. I saw like some public facing thing, like a few slides back there. That, sorry, there files. it is, public files. That's what we need. Thanks, Delara. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, that's what we can use to log in. So, nope, this isn't what I want. There's going to be a lot of me switching between windows tonight. Yeah. Um, so this is the command down here. Uh, minus the L and I believe the N. Yeah, there we go. So I'm going to move this over. Um, so SMB client is a way to actually connect to, to Windows shares uh, using using a program from Kali. So there we go, SMB client, all those backslashes. We're gonna connect to that file server that has anonymous log on, and then slash slash and that public files folder. And it wants a password for us. We can connect anonymously, so we just hit enter and bam, we have what looks like a command line. Uh, so if we type ls, um, ooh, this is too big for this. There we go. If we type ls, uh, SMB client will work with, with bash commands. I believe it also works with Windows commands. Yeah, directory and ls. Um, we can see some files on here. So there's a file, howdy.txt, that's being shared in there. That's on that Windows machine. Uh, it jazz, remind me, it's get howdy.txt, I believe. Yep, and then that copies yep. it over to your machine. So you've just logged in anonymously, and now you have access to that file. So yeah, get and then the file name to get something from the SMB client. I'm going to type exit and then if I ls, there we see howdy.txt is there. Uh, reminder, there are flags available in tonight's workshop uh, if you would like. Um, I think the only person here that actually qualifies for using the flags might be Kyle. <laughs> um, Kyle, if you're following along and if you didn't get a, an account to connect, let me know if you want to, to actually try this stuff. I think you might have missed the part where we were connecting to this this Kali machine. Um, okay, so we've been able to log in anonymously. This is this is good for us because now we have tools that can abuse this anonymous logon privilege to start getting accounts for us. And go ahead. The tool that we're going to use is lookupsid.py. Um, so I want you to give this a shot. Yeah, okay. I want you to give this a shot. So it's sudo, uh, sorry, you can leave the sudo off. You you have permission to run this. So just look up sid.py and then anonymous at and the the ID or sorry, the, the IP address of the machine you're connecting to. I'm just going to send Kyle some connection, uh, some some credentials.
Okay, anyone able to get anything from that? Anyone have any trouble running it? I'm going to go ahead and run it here. Uh, thankfully, it remembers all of my commands. So look up sid.py. So this is an impacket tool, uh, this .py thing. Um, we're going to connect as anonymous at that IP address. And there's no password here. So that's what the output is. What are we looking at is sort of the question. So what lookup SID is doing is it's logging in anonymously and then it's just asking the server for information about the SID or the service, I believe it's the service identification number or service ID. Um, and you can see here it's brute forcing them. It's just asking for, for them in a sort of sequential order and then seeing what the server spits back out at it. And this is an ability that some that people can do when they have access to the server, which is why it's bad that the anonymous user has access because anyone can then go in and ask for this information. So if we were doing this as an attack, we would now look at this and say, what have we got? Um, this is the user server. That's what I told you this, this server was. It's a server on this domain in Active Directory. And what you want to look at is this thing back, uh, here, the SID type user. So these with user on them are going to be users on this machine. This one here says group, that is not a user. These ones down here are users. So this would now give us a bunch of users that are available on this machine. So we have SSHD, uh, hmm, interesting, Jeremy admin, uh, local user, a, a guest account, there's an administrator account, uh, default. What you would want to do is take these and copy them into your notes. These are all users that are going to be useful. I am going to take them and put them into a file, a text file. Um, I'm just going to do this with vim. Uh, I'm going to say accounts.txt. And you could copy them one by one. I'm going to copy uh, Jeremy admin sshd and I don't know guest so I'll paste that one in you want to do this one on each line uh, and let's try administrator I'm gonna go ahead and write and close that and so now I have uh, some accounts and if you were taking notes you would note down that, hey, I've found some user accounts in this system. So this is good. This is the first step in us figuring out uh, how to get into this Active Directory system. So yeah, that's what we just saw. That's what it looks like. I put these all on here in case everything crashed. Um, so yeah, we want those users, copy them out. And we now have a list of users on the user server. So I'm going to do this after every step we do. This is what we just did. Uh, there's the domain controller over here. There's the user server. And then there's us on our little Kali machine inside this network. We're pretending that we have uh, a connection onto this network and it's running a bunch of Active Directory stuff. So we checked the SMB shares and access on both of these machines. We found that this one, the user server, has anonymous shares. And then we used that lookup SID to brute force those SIDs from this user server uh, using the anonymous access. And this got us the users that are on that user server. So this is helpful. This is good for us. Now we have a place to start. We've got some usernames. We can start testing those out. So the next thing we're going to do is before Kerber roasting, we're going to learn about ASREP roasting. And before I go on, any questions, any concerns, any doubts? Everyone good? Great. OK. Um, as rep roasting. So in the world of Kerber roasting, uh, in, in the world of Kerberos, there is a setting that lets us uh, connect basically without authenticating. I'll show you what this looks like. So uh, imagine the steps in our Kerberos protocol. Remember, we sent some stuff and first authenticated onto the system to get the ticket granting ticket. Basically, this, this says, what if we could skip all of that? What if we didn't have to actually authenticate onto the system? What if we could just tell it, hey, I'm this user. Just, just give me access to that file server over there. Um, 
and what this what this would do, uh, or what this looks like, is inside of Windows, in that in the server. In, sorry, this is on the domain controller this time. Uh, an account gets set up, and down here there's a bunch of options for that account. One of them is do not require Kerberos pre-authentication. I have read a bunch on the internet and cannot figure out why for the life of me this option exists. Um, I've written things by other pen testers who say the same thing. They're just like, I, it's not clear why that's an option, but it is. Uh, what this is going to allow us to do is basically go to the, the domain controller and say, hey, I'm, I'm, some, I'm this person. Can I have access to the file server? And if this option is set, then the domain controller is going to go, oh, I don't need to authenticate you. I'm allowed to just give you the thing without making sure you are who you say you are. Uh, so we're going to abuse that. So we're going to, as the client, send a message to the domain controller saying, hey, can I, can I get access uh, can I get access to something? And the thing we're going to get access to is actually going to contain the password for the user that, that we're, we're asking on behalf of. So uh, this is called ASREP roasting. The reason it's called ASREP roasting is because these messages that are sent back and forth each have a specific name. Uh, the name of the message that we're going to be abusing in this case is known as ASREP. Um, and it's A or, or Sorry, that says AP rep, it should be AS rep. Um, yeah, it's that's the name of the message. Uh, so I think rep is response, I can't remember. Um, so go ahead and run this command. And what this is going to do is it is going to try to connect to the domain controller using all of the users that we have in our user file, that file that I just made with those four users in it, we need that. Um, if anyone wants that file or wants me to list it again, just let me know. Um, but this command is going to try to connect to the domain controller, and it's going to, for each one of those users, just say, hey, can I get something without pre-authenticating? And the domain controller will send something back if that option is sent. Uh, so this is a vulnerability that can be exploited, essentially. We can ask for stuff on behalf of users, and it's not going to make sure we're that user which is again why that setting is weird and not clear why it exists. So go ahead and try this command. I'm going to get my terminal back up and move it off to the side. Um, but you guys should be able to do this. So get np users.py. Um, then you need to put in the domain name. Remember I said the domain was important. It's because it's used in these things. We need to tell the domain controller which domain we want to do this for. Uh, notice that the IP address next is for the domain controller, not the user server. So what, we, what we're doing is we found on the user server that there's an admin, like an account that has admin in it. And we're going to go now to the domain controller and, and just see, hey, do any of those admin accounts also exist on that domain controller? Uh, and so... Anyone having trouble running that? Any problems? Here's my command down here. Uh, this again is another impacket tool. And this tool is specifically just for checking out accounts that have this do not pre-authenticate set. So I run it and this is the reply that I get. I'm thinking you guys probably have the same thing. Um, interesting stuff, interesting stuff. Down here we can say, we can see user administrator doesn't have UF don't require pre-auth set. So this tells us that, that the, the account name administrator that we put into the file, that exists on this domain controller. And what it's telling us is UF don't require pre-auth, that's the setting for the do not pre-authenticate Kerberos that, that I showed you, that checkbox. Um, these other two here, is telling us that client credentials have been revoked and it couldn't find it. So one user has probably been revoked on the system. It might have a, 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 a listing for it, but it's been kicked off the system. And this one here saying that Kerberos just couldn't find it. And this is Kerberos that we're communicating with right now. This, this tool is communicating with that Kerberos uh, program that's running on the domain controller. Remember those ports that we saw that were Kerberos related? That's what it's communicating with. And now I get to 
do this. This is what happens when Jeremy makes slides at 3 a.m. Um, we get this response. Oh, gasp. What's that? A hash. Yay. So we have found uh, a hash. What has been returned to us is a hash that is related to, as you can see here, the Jeremy admin account. So this tells us that the Jeremy admin account exists on the domain controller and it has that setting, the do not pre-authenticate setting set. So the Jeremy admin user could just ask for things without being authenticated and get stuff back. Another interesting thing to note, the KRB5 AS rep um, is the start. This is the type of hash. This is this deals with, uh, as you saw, as rep. Um, and it's on that domain, first.local. And then this is a big old hash. Thankfully, this tool and Impacket has formatted this properly for us so that we can use John on it. So we're going to go ahead and do that. I want you to copy this whole thing. Uh, this is one of those things you'd want to copy down in your notes for the attack. And I want you to put that into a file. Don't echo it in because we found that that caused problems yesterday. I think you could echo it possibly without a new line and that might fix it, but uh, just to pass that up, we're going to say uh, jeremyhash.txt and I'm going to paste that into a file. Write and quit. And there's jeremyhash.txt. So now we've got a hash. Uh, we know what to do with hashes because we've had a whole workshop on it now. And a lot of us have seen hashes in the past in some of the, the practices that we've been running off on the side. So um, go ahead and crack the hash. Uh, you can use John or you can use hashcat. Uh, I'm gonna use John. We're gonna take this. This is Jeremy hash is the name of my file. So I'm just going to use a previous command I used. Um, this is what it's going to look like. So it's John, then file name for me, and then uh, this line here. So word lists equals slash user slash share slash word lists slash rocky dot text. So I've, uh, I've unzipped rocky. It's available for you in that folder. Everyone should have access to it. And let me know if you have any problems here. I'm going to go ahead and run this myself. And runs pretty quick. I think I took a password out of RockU that was higher up in the list. Uh, so this is telling us that it's found this hash here and it found a password. Excellent. We now have a password for Jeremy admin. So let's go ahead and copy that. Let's pretend we're making some notes here. Jeremy admin, that's the password. Good stuff. Ah, yeah, there's the John. There's what we just saw. Uh, so yes, now we have a user and a password that exists in this system. Um, and we are going to try uh, using it to get into the user server. So I want you to actually try it on the user server. Does anyone know how we're going to use it on the user server? Shout it out if you know it. What's a way we could try to connect to the user server? Silence. Like SSH or something? Ethan's got it. Ethan remembers. <laughs> um, yep, yeah, SSH. Uh, in, in those scans that I had you do at the beginning, um, SSH is running on the uh, user server. Um, dot 50. Let's see if this goes any faster for me when we're not all doing it. Actually, I should have just... Um, if we go back to that scan, we will notice that uh, port 22 was open on this machine. So go ahead and SSH into that machine. We are 
Jeremy admin. We're going to be at that address. That's the dot 50. That's the user server. This is where we got those credentials in the first place. We need the password. We got that earlier. I'm just going to copy it and connect. And bam, this is a magic trick that blows my mind. We have we are currently SSH'd onto a Kali machine that is now SSH'd onto a Windows server. Um, and we could check. This is definitely not a bash terminal because LS is not working, but DIR does work. So at this point, we could check around uh, what's on here. I'm going to tell you right now, I put all the flags and files in the documents folder. So if this was an actual check, you would check around in this system. But we're just going to go into documents. And nice, we see some files in here. Um, we see a flag.txt, which I'm going to leave to you guys to open up if you want to do that. But we also see um, a message here called Alex email script. Uh, that looks that looks interesting. Let's take a look at what's in there. And we're going to do that with type. Uh, on a Windows machine, uh, type equals cat. Cat equals type. So Alex email script dot text. And see what's in there. I'm going to give you guys a minute to look at this and tell me what you think. What do we? What's useful? What do we have here? Ten seconds. Anyone want to say it? Has anyone found anything they think is useful in here? Um, there are listed users, and there is a password. Yeah, bingo. You got it. <laughs> Thank you, Ethan. Ethan saves me every time. I'm trying to do interaction. If this were in person. I would love to see a bunch of smiling faces staring back at me. Um, this is the best we can do for now. But uh, yeah, thanks for thanks for answering, Ethan. That's that's right. Um, what I've done is I have craft, crafted a, an email here from Alex Tenney, club president, and also admin at magpie.com. Um, and it's to me, and it's the new account script to Jeremy admin. She says, here's the script I've been using to create new accounts. Hope it helps. Um, so this is a script that Alex had at some point. We can see here it was from about a year ago, November 23rd, 2020. Um, but this is a script that seems to set a password, um, and it sets some sort of default password, and then it creates a new group called users, and then it has a list of users here. Down here is a for loop, and all it does is create the users with these, this password. But um, this potentially is helpful for us. It we now have a password and a bunch of users. This is a year old. Maybe they've changed their passwords. Maybe they've disappeared. We don't know. Let's go ahead and copy that out, though. This is useful stuff. This is actually super useful stuff. This is like somebody wrote this for us. I wrote this for you. Um, we've got Josh2, Steve P, and Ren K. And we've got what is potentially a password for them. So let's copy all of that out. Good for us. We've we've made some some advances. Um, so if you've done that, we're going to go again. So this is what ASRep roasting was. We just did some ASRep roasting. Um, what we did was having found something on the user server, some some uh, account names, some user names. We put that into a file, and then we ran a, ran a program, the git np use, uh, users, spelled that, users.py, on the domain controller. So what we did was we checked with the domain controller. We checked with Kerberos on the domain controller. Do any of these users have that pre-authentication 
uh, turned off. And if they do, and we just ran each of those accounts, we get a reply with uh, encrypted with a user password, and then we crack the hash output from that, that hash that gives us a, that user's password. So that's how we got the Jeremy admin account. We saw that it existed on here. We tested over here to see if it existed and if it had pre-authentication turned off. It did. The reply we got was nicely formatted into us, uh, nicely formatted for us with a hash, and we cracked that hash, and then we used that hash to get into the user server. So this user probably exists on the domain controller and the user server. That's what we know now. We know it definitely exists on the user server because we got a password there. Probably exists on the domain controller as well. We're going to skip the part where we would log in on the domain controller. Uh, I'm going to tell you right now, it's not that useful with this account because we're going to move on to the next step, which is Kerber roasting, the thing that's in the title of this workshop. It's an hour and 10 minutes, and we finally made it. So going back to our protocol, remembering the steps, we start out by sending the authenticator, that message saying, I want to log into the system, to the key distribution, to the, the domain controller, the, key, the KDC, key distribution center. We send it. It decrypts it using our password. It says, OK, you are who you say you are. I'm going to send you back this ticket granting ticket. Great, now we're authenticated on the domain. Now we say, I want to access the file server. We send the ticket granting ticket, and it checks that everything's good. And now it's going to send back the ticket granting service for that file server. And this is where there's a potential weakness. So once we get this, this ticket back, it's encrypted with the password for the file server, or the key or the password, whatever it's, whatever it's using. It's encrypted with something that only the file server should know. And that is useful for us. We can try to decrypt this thing because we, we have an idea of what's inside of it. We have an idea of the standard size or what the tickets look like. Uh, but we would get this back, and we could try to decrypt it. The problem, the problem is, that when these things are set up, when machines and services are set up inside of the domain, some clever person decided that their password should be extremely long because it doesn't cost very much to use a really long password if you're a computer just making up random strings. So anytime there's a file server or a database that is automatically set up on the system or that has been installed automatically in the system, it's very likely that it has set its own password and that it's used an extremely long password. And I say extremely long in that nobody's going to break these things anytime soon. Yeah, it, trying to brute force them, that is. Uh, the other thing is that they also rotate these keys. I think it's every 30 days. So there are security measures in place to make sure that if you get this ticket and you start trying to brute force it, if you don't get it within 30 days at least, then it's, very, then it's going to be reset, in which case you have to start all over again. And you're, you're not going to get it within 30 days. So that's not where the weakness is. The weakness is actually in the fact that you can also set up services in the system which rely on user accounts. So instead of it being set up automatically, it's being set up using a user account. And if it's set up using a user account, then the password or the key that is used for that service is not being automatically generated by the machine. It's being generated by the user password. And this is something called a service principal name. So these, these, uh, these file servers, these databases, printers, things like that, they can be assigned these things called uh, service principal names. It's just a way of identifying them. And if they're created by a user, then they use the user's password, not the nice, big, safe uh, machine-generated password. So Kerber roasting makes use of abusing this fact that if a user is the one that's associated with the service or with the machine, and that password is being used, then we can probably crack that, because we know that humans and users are awful with passwords. And that's what Kerber roasting relies on. So uh, service principal names, we've already talked about those. Uh, Impacket has a nice program that's, or a nice function or yeah, program that's written called getuserspns.py. And we're going to use that to try to 
see if there are any of these service principal names that are associated with user accounts on the domain controller. So go ahead and try running this. Um, I'm going to tell you right now, we had three usernames uh, that we got with a password. Uh, and we thought, hey, maybe some of those still exist on the system. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you it's RenK. Um, so you can use RenK's username. And this is still RenK's password. And you can go ahead and run this in the system and uh, against the domain controller, the dot 100, and see what you get back. I'll give you a second to do that. I'm going to take some water. Um, Jeremy, mm -hmm. um, sorry, you're not reading your messages. You you didn't add the flags to Orchid, I don't think, and we can't find the flags to add them for you. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Yep. You know what? I didn't actually add the flags. <laughs> I forgot to add the flags. Um. Kyle, hold on to your flags. I'll add them when the workshop is done, and I'll let you know. Uh, for anyone else that's grabbing flags out, um, I'll add the flags after the workshop. Make a note of them. I'm sorry about that. I completely forgot forgot it. I've got a list of them, and I forgot to add them. Um, is anyone having trouble otherwise? Ah, Brayden had trouble cracking the hash. Brayden, did you end up getting it to work? Any luck there? Okay, I'm going to... Actually, I'm just going to clear this. Um, get users. I have the benefit of having done all of this before. Um, so we are going to uh, run this one. So get user service principal names, spns.py. Uh, again, the domain controller IP address is an argument that it wants. And then this right here. So this is first.local slash renk. And then the password. This is who we're going to be logging in as. So. Again, we need credentials to go after the system. Uh, RenK has credentials on the system, so we're going to log in trying it as Ren. We, I'm telling you that exists. So it's going to be able to interact with Kerberos using these credentials. And then it's going to ask if there are any service principal names that are associated with usernames. And then we do outputs file here, and it's going to go to test.txt. And this is the output that we get. So. Uh, it worked. You can see Impacket up here, um, Secure Auth Corporation. They're the people that, that manage Impacket. So here's the service principal name. Um, it's a MySQL service. And the name that it's associated to is roast.user. And the password was set uh, yesterday when I spun up this server. Um, great. So this worked. And what this is telling us is that there is a service that exists on the system that is associated with a username. There's lots of other services that exist in this Active Directory system, but they don't have, they're not associated to a user. They're probably associated to, to like computer uh, service accounts. So this is good for us. Uh, Brayden wasn't able to crack the hash. Okay, we'll, we'll take a look at that after. I'm not sure what the issue was there. Um, so this is great. Uh, but where is the thing that we want? Well, it's in that output file that we specified in the line here. So I uh, called mine test.txt. We're going to spit that out. And blam, look at this. Another very useful thing. Um, and we get another hash. This is similar to the one that we got before. Uh, notice it starts with KRB. So Kerberos uh, 5 and then TGS. So this is a ticket granting service for the roast user. And it's for the roast user on that MySQL uh, account. 
And this whole thing is going to be encrypted with the roast user's password. So knowing this, we can now pass this into John, the same way that we did with the other one. So I'm again going to copy this, and I'm not going to echo it. I'm going to say uh, roast hash dot text. I'm going to paste that in there. Paste that in there. Good. And now John, same thing. roast hash dot text. <laughs> ah, okay, Braden got it working, nice. Oh yeah, 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 I, I make those mistakes all the time. Don't worry about that, Braden. <laughs> it gets the best of us. Um, okay, so I'm gonna run this, and now John's gonna work away on that hash. Um, a Kerberos 5 TGS hash uh, which is built into John, thank God. John knows how to, how to run this. Uh, it's running against the Rocku list, and sure enough, that roast user has a password, and that is password at one. So I'm going to copy that. We're going to write that down in our notes. We've got a roast user with the password, password at one. Let me just go to my slides to make sure I'm not jumping ahead, a la a professor that we all know. Um, yep, so there's a big old hash. We've done that. We've cracked the hash. And we've seen here that the hash here is just password at one. Um, I think we've got a little bit of time, so I'm going to show you what this looks like again on that Windows side. Um, again, we've connected to the domain controller and interacted with Kerberos to get that ticket and then cracked the hash for that ticket. Uh, to get the password for a user, I just need to get the IP address for that machine, uh, the domain controller. So now I'm going to connect to the domain controller um, over remote desktop. Maximize this. Um, so this is a domain controller. It looks a lot like a Windows machine. And yep, it just uses a standard desktop. But I'm going to go to Server Manager. This is going to load up. So this is what is used in Active Directory to manage the Active Directory. And this is do a domain controller, so it has access to a lot of stuff. Um, all of these things down here are services and things that we can manage in the system. I want... Uh, the local server. Actually, no, I want tools. Uh, you can see there's lots of stuff here. This is really complicated stuff. People can get credentials just in Active Directory. So I'm going to go to Active Directory users. Um, and this is where all the users are managed. So I can add more users. I can delete users. I can change the user's permissions. Uh, I'm going to go down here, these users. And these are all, this is probably really tiny for you guys. I'm not sure if I can zoom in on this. Can I find an object? No, view, uh, small icons, large icons. Yeah, maybe that's a little better. Um, these are all users that are on this machine. Uh, you can see that some of them, uh, there's one here, Jeremy Stewart. Uh, there's the administrator over here is the roast user. Uh, these are probably groups or super users that are on here. Yeah, these are groups. There's multiple ones, but uh, there's the roast user that we set earlier. Um, oh, there's our there's our friend Ren. So if I double click on Ren, here's all of his account information. There's there's the username and logon Ren K. Um, if I go to the Jeremy Stewart account, I'll actually show you. If I scroll down here on the account options, you can see this thing is checked. The do not require Kerberos pre-authentication. That was what we abused for the ASREP roasting. Um, but our roast user is here. And we can see all kinds of things about this user. There's profile information, telephone, organization. Um, it's a member of the domain users group. So the domain users are over here, and these groups will have sp uh, specific permissions set for them. Uh, there is 
uh, there, there are services that are then created that are associated with this roast user, that MySQL one is associated to the roast user. That's how we're able to get the ticket and get the password out of it, assuming that the user has set a weak password. Um, let's go to the domain users over here. And it tells us all of these things are members of the domain users. So we see that Ren is in there. We can see that Jeremy is in there. Uh, this this isn't the most exciting stuff, but this is this is the system that you're attacking right now. This is what it looks like from the administrator's side when they're setting and, and doing all of this stuff. When we did the practice for this yesterday, we thought uh, it might be interesting and make it a little more concrete if you guys weren't just doing command line and imagining what you were attacking. This is actually what you're attacking on the system. So I think I think I can just minimize this. We're sort of done here. We've seen what that is. Um, and so one more time to help solidify all of this, uh, what we just did. So we just we just Kerber roasted uh, an account on this. And we did it by finding that we had those Ren K credentials from the user server. Remember there was that, that email we found and we used those credentials from the user server. We then ran this, this thing to get the service principal names to check for those, those service principal names associated with, sorry, this says Ren. It's not with Ren, it's with any users. We found one uh, associated with roast.user and that was the MySQL service. The MySQL service was started up using roast.user's credentials. Um, and so we get a hash for roast.user, we crack it, and now we get a new user and a password for the system. And that's what Kerber roasting is. Uh, Kerber roasting is getting credentials on a system and then looking for these service principal names and trying to crack uh, hashes that are associated with user accounts for that, that have weaker passwords and that are associated to services in the system. Um, we only got one of these back when we, did, when we ran this command. You can imagine something like the university, if you manage to get in and do something like this, you might find tons of stuff associated. Uh, this is, again, just like a sandbox and a bit of a toy example that I've set up just for us. Um, so now we move into part four, the last thing that we're going to work on, and that's uh, a secrets dump or dumping secrets from this machine. Uh, just to give a little bit of an overview, remember we started out with just a Kali machine. We're on a network. There's some stuff on there. We found out that one is a domain controller. One of them, I just told you, is just a server that's running. We managed to get into the server. We managed to get some credentials out of that. After that, we managed to get the password for one of those users. So now, now we have a username and password on the system. Using that, we were able to find Ren's username and password. We used that to get the username and password for the roast user. So we've gone from just seeing that there are some machines out there to now having multiple usernames and uh, passwords f uh, that, are, that are working on both the domain controller and the server. But the domain controller is the one we're really interested in. If you remember back to that slide uh, early on when we were talking about, do we put the passwords out to every machine or do we keep them in one place? And I said, if you put them all in one place, you're putting all of your eggs in one basket. You're putting the passwords on one computer. And if you can get into that computer, things are gonna get pretty bad. This is where that starts getting pretty bad. We're gonna dump secrets from that machine using some of the credentials that we've found. Um, remember that when I say that machine, I mean the domain controller, the one that's holding um, all of those those keys in that diagram. Remember that, that Kerberos uh, diagram that I was using? When tickets and keys were being passed back and forth, the domain controller had all the keys. We want to get in there and try to get some more of those keys. So we're going to use uh, Secret Dump, and this is another Impacket tool that is used to attack uh, Windows machines, and especially domain controllers is, is what it really likes to, to work on, because that's where that's where all the crown jewels are. That's where all the good stuff is. Um, so this time I want you to log into the domain controller as Ren K. We used Ren to just check the, the service principal names. We ran a script using Ren K's credentials. We haven't actually tried to log into anything using Ren K's credentials. So go ahead and log in to uh, the domain controller. I'm just going to see if there's any messages that I've missed. Oh god, I've got like a hundred direct messages. <laughs> <laughs> any 
Anyone able to log in yet? <laughs> it's just everybody asking me if the flags were added to Orchid. Sorry, just to clarify, we're connecting to uh, one of the machines with RenK, and then uh, that's through SSH. Uh, can you connect through SSH? I I did. I I don't know if I'm connected to the right, to the correct machine. I'm connected to um, dot one dot fifty, ah, which is no not the that's not the domain yeah. controller. So okay. what I was trying to do was to stump everybody. Um, <laughs> What I have found is maybe there's one person following along. Um, the question is, how do you connect to the domain controller using Renke's credentials? And if you go back to your Nmap for this machine, uh, you would have noticed, or you'll note that um, port 22 on this one is not open. You can't SSH into this machine. It's not, uh, SSH is not running in the background. So side note, it's a bunch of work to get SSH working in a Windows machine and getting it set up and working properly, uh, depending on the machine. Uh, that's just, just an aside. But yeah, we can't SSH into this machine. So I've just asked you to do something and didn't tell you how. Um, I was trying to see if you would get stumped by this. Uh, the answer is that Impacket has built a wonderful tool for logging into a machine. They, it's called wmiexec.py, and you can use it to log into the domain controller. Um, so this is a Windows management interface. Uh, it allows you to connect to a Windows machine remotely using credentials, and uh, it's a sort of lightweight protocol for interacting with a machine. Um, so Try to use that to, yeah, here's the command right here, wmiexec.py, and then again, it's that first dot local, so domain slash user, um, and then at, and the uh, IP address of the machine. Again, that's gonna be a local IP address on the local network of this AWS cloud setup. Um, it's gonna ask you for a password. Luckily, you wrote down Ren's password, so you can connect this way. If anyone needs that password, let me know. And I'm going to go ahead and do that here. Hmm. Get rid of that as a giveaway for what comes next. <laughs> um, it wants a password. Luckily, I wrote down just such a password. Maybe I pass pasted the password wrong. That's an admin. Oh, it's admin. I don't know. That's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's why what I did didn't make sense. Thanks, Delara. There we go. All right. Uh, we now have a nice little uh, lightweight shell uh, for interacting. So uh, directory, we are logged in as Ren. So we can run who am I on the Windows machine. And it says we are Renk on the first domain. Um, what we would like to know is what privileges Ren has. That would be useful for us. Let me see here. Yeah, what privileges does Ren-K have? Um, I could make you look it up, but that's not the fun part. The command is just going to be net users Ren-K. So run this command, net users Ren-K, and this will tell you about Ren's privileges. Uh, tell me if there's any privileges that you notice that might be useful for Ren. Keep that up for a second, and then I'll go do it myself in just a minute. sewers, we want users.
anything here that stands out to you guys that would be useful to know about Ren? Could it be with uh, the global group memberships? Yeah, it 100% is. Anytime you see admin, um, <laughs> when you're trying to break into a machine, anytime you see admin, um, that's usually something that you want to pay attention to, I'd say. This is, this is just a general silly Jeremy rule that I made up right now. Um, but yeah, this is, this is what we're interested in. It looks like Ren is a member of the domain admins. So I showed you earlier there were groups and I showed you the users that were in domain users. Uh, Ren is actually in the group domain admins, which means that Ren is probably an admin on this system. Um, and since this is the domain controller, the thing that, that runs everything, uh, we can probably, we can use Ren's credentials to start abusing this machine. His elevated privileges we're gonna use to uh, get some more, get some good stuff out of this machine. So let's go ahead and exit out of this. We've, we've gone in as Ren, we've got his, his credentials. Uh, we are going to run our last impacket tool here there we go. He's a domain admin. Go Ren. Uh, yes, we're going to use this to access and dump hashes out of this machine. Uh, so you're going to use uh, this secret dump dot pi. This is another impacket tool built for dumping secrets. So this is what the command looks like: secrets dump dot pi, and then again first dot local slash Ren K at and then the IP, uh, and again, it's going to want the password. So I'll leave that up for just a minute. Any, I should stop and just pause. Any questions, anyone confused, anyone completely lost and has been lost for a long time now? Is it very unclear to anyone what is happening right now? <laughs> Might be a, a better question. When I ask these questions, I should check my messages to see if that happens. Ah, yeah, Kyle, Kyle said it as well. Ren appears to be an admin. Sorry, I've got a bunch of windows running. Ah, you missed the password. Which uh, which password was it? The password for Ren that you missed, Ned? Okay, let me let me send you that password. There you go. I just DM'd it to you. Okay, so I'm going to say that you guys have had time to run a uh, secrets dump. Uh, what is secrets dump doing? Secrets dump is a script or a program that has been built into Impacket, and what it does is it abuses a bunch of vulnerabilities in Windows machines to go in and try to dump hashes and secrets out of a Windows machine in a whole bunch of different places. So I'm going to now run it. It's Ren. I'm going to paste Ren's password in. So what this is now doing is it is now trying to, it's logging in as Ren and it's accessing different areas of the machine using his admin, prev, uh, his or their admin privileges, I should say their admin privileges. Um, and dumping out hashes and secrets from all kinds of different places inside of the machine. So this is abusing a bunch of vulnerabilities or the fact that uh, Ren is an admin in a bunch of places. So you can see anything that starts here with a star is part of the, the program. So this is just uh, sort of debug notes that are printing out. So it's dumping local SAM hashes. Uh, I can't remember which ones are which. So some of these are hashes that are stored as registry keys inside the, the Microsoft registry. We saw some of those uh, last year in the malware workshop. We looked at the registry a little bit. 
So it's dumping some from registry, it's pulling some of these out of memory, it's abusing everything that it knows of in a Windows machine to try to get these out. And as you can see, there's a lot of these. These should look pretty familiar to you. Um, if you've done anything on a Linux machine, uh, if you've taken Computer Science 329 with Dr. Well, usually Dr. Henry, but uh, other professors are teaching it now. Um, you've gone into Etsy Shadow and Etsy Password and seen uh, passwords that are hashed and uh, salted, uh, but they look similar to these. There's, there's what looks to be usernames, uh, probably user numbers, like the user ID number, um, and then these things. Uh, these are hashes. These look, these look great, and we've got a lot of them. Remember that list of users I showed you on the machine? A lot of these names were in there, so user all dot user. Um, this, this setup, I said that this has been like a sandbox that was set up for us to practice attacks on. Um, it is already pre-configured with a lot of users for doing all kinds of different attacks uh, against Active Directory. So that's why there's so many things in here right now. Uh, if this was just a vanilla setup, it wouldn't have this much stuff. Um, interestingly here, some things to note, KRBTGT. Um, this is the service of the process or the account that does the ticket granting tickets. If, if I remember correctly, I'm pretty sure that's right. Um, so it's, it's grabbed keys from Kerberos. We can see a bunch of those down here. Uh, there's the administrator and there's an admin account as well. So it grabbed those directly from Kerberos. Um, there's more of them up here. These look more familiar. These probably look like your hashed passwords. That's great. Um, what else did it dump? Uh, it dumped the administrator account, the guest account, the default account. So those are being held somewhere wherever these SAM hashes are being held. Um, so this is, this is a lot more useful information for us. We have just managed to dump a whole lot of stuff from this machine. And if we were trying to attack, uh, or we're doing a sort of pen test, this is the point where you'd say there's big problems with this machine because we've just been given access to a ton of stuff. So we could try uh, cracking these hashes, and if you tried to do this, uh, but we tried it yesterday, we ran into problems. Um, these aren't formatted in a way that John can use. I believe you'd have to do a bit of work to get that to work, um, but these are still really useful. So what I want you to do is, I'm gonna ask you to take the admin account credential that you see here. Um, actually, not the whole thing. I just want you to copy this hash bit on the end here. So there is a bunch of text, a colon, and then a bunch of text. Go ahead and just copy that. Instead of you having to do all of these accounts all on your own, we've got a time limit. Just copy that out. I'm going to show you how we can use that. Anyone having any problems with this right now? One's good. Okay. Um, Sorry, I believe I've copied it, but I'm gonna do it one more time. Admin. Um, so this is a hash. I think this is an NTLM hash from a Windows machine. Um, we're gonna steal this out. Uh, yeah, there's there's tons of stuff that's being printed out here for us. Uh, there's, there's, it's actually telling us the type of of mode that it's using and hashing for these. There's an HVAN, HMAC, nice. Um, we can use this hash to try to connect to the system. Um, so here I said crack the admin hash, we're gonna skip this step. It wouldn't work if you just tried to crack it in John. Um, I, could show, I could show you what it does, but we'll skip it. John just prints out a bunch of stuff at a bunch of hashes it guesses it could be. It doesn't figure out which one it is and it doesn't get the password from it. So you might think, oh, this hash is useless, um, but instead we're gonna learn about something called passing the hash. Uh, you may have heard of pass the hash. It's just a technique for, or, or a way to log into something without having to send a password. You could send the hash of the password instead. And machines are sometimes configured to accept hashes instead of the actual password. So we're going to do that. Uh, we're going to use WMI again. 
So I want you to go ahead and use WMI, except this time you're going to use it on the admin account. And I didn't write the command out here, but let me write out exec.py. This is that first command that you saw with the big long hash at the end. There. So then I type dot hashes and then space, and then I can, nope, that's the wrong one. Paste in uh, that hash. And what this is gonna do is WMI is built with uh, a nice thing that says, if you give it a hash, WMI will try to log in using the hash, not, not the password. So go ahead and try this, if everyone can see that. So again, just WMI uh, first.local slash admin at, and then this is the domain controller, and then tack hashes, and then that big long hash that we used before, or that we copied over before. I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And WMI is able to log in. There, we didn't need the password for admin, we could just use the hash. So that's called passing the hash uh, being to, to log in. I'm gonna run who am I? And awesome, I'm, I'm admin. So you could go through and see where stuff is on this machine. Uh, what do we have, where am I? It's users. Uh, and now we can access the admin account. Yeah. And I said that the good stuff is in documents. Ah, there it is, the good stuff. Uh, for those of you who are doing this, who aren't execs and can get flag points, and I think that's just Kyle right now. Um, there you go, there's your free internet points once I get them added to the server. Again, sorry, I didn't do that. All right, um, so this, uh, we're just gonna go over again what we just did. So uh, we used WMI with Ren's credentials to connect to the domain controller. We checked Ren's privileges. We found that Ren is a domain admin, so Ren has lots of great privileges. We then ran the secrets dump program from Impacket with Ren K's credentials using his admin privileges, and it was able to abuse vulnerabilities in the in the Windows system to dump all kinds of hashes from memory in the registry. And then we passed the hash uh, to exec into the, the machine as the admin user and find that last flag. So that's what we just did. Any questions? Any everyone good there? We're about to wrap up. Okay. So then, just to go over everything we did in this workshop, um, the first thing we did was we learned how to enumerate users. We did that using uh, SMB and anonymous logins. So we abused uh, that privilege on the user server. We then did ASREP roasting which we learned was a vulnerability about how the ticket gets passed, or, or sorry, a, a vulnerability with, with a, a misconfiguration or, or a setting that's been ticked that lets us request tickets for a, a server or for a service without authenticating. So we don't need the ticket granting ticket, we just get the ticket granting service right away. After that, we learned what Kerber roasting is. So we were able to Kerber roast an account on the domain controller on this guy over here. And we did that by uh, checking to see if there were any services that were started with user accounts. There was, we were able to crack the hash on that hash it gave back to us and get an, a password for that account. And then we found that Ren was an admin and we were able to dump a ton of secrets from the domain controller. So uh, I hope you've seen a little bit about what's going on in the background with Active Directory and learned how some of these misconfigurations or these little weird settings that are in there can cause uh, big problems and how to attack a machine. Um, did I put all of these in? Yeah, I think I put in just a review of what the Kerberos protocol is. To authenticate, you send a message, encrypt it with your key, key distribution center decrypts it, says only you have that password. So uh, your password decrypts this message properly. So that must be you. It sends you something back, the ticket granting ticket with its own key, you hold on to that. Then to access anything on the system, you send that back. It's able to decrypt. It says, okay, whoever has one of these tickets, one of these ticket granting tickets has to have been authenticated. So this person must be okay. Gives you back a TGS, a ticket granting service for whatever you want. In this case, the file server. You get that. 
and you then and now you're on the system and you send that to the file server and do the same thing. This is what the Kerberos protocol is doing in the background to manage users being able to connect to all kinds of different things in the system. This is the authentication and authorization that it controls. Um, with that, I hope you guys learned a lot. This has all been based, this the, everything we did today, on a room on TryHackMe called Volnet Roasted. Uh, the Volnet, uh, Volnet is a, a series, I think like five or six different rooms. One of them is uses Kerber roasting, and it uses all the techniques you've seen here. If you've been following along, you should be able to go to that room and make plenty of progress if you felt like you understood. You could go back and refer to this workshop or some of the tools that we used. All of them are used in this room, and I think pretty much everything we did should be able to get you uh, all the way to, to the root user on, on that room. So if you found this interesting, if you want to practice it a little more, here is a room that is built to use everything that you've learned, and it should really help you solidify those concepts. So I hope everyone enjoyed this. I hope you found it useful. Um, it was it was uh, it worked about about as well as I could have hoped. It took a long time to get this <laughs> this infrastructure set up all in the cloud so that everyone could use it. I'm really happy that uh, people followed along. Um, yeah, I hope you have an appreciation for what Kerberos is, how Kerberosting works, and how attacks against Active Directory work, um, and how this exists or like how this is possible out in the wild. Again, like most things we do in cybersecurity, a lot of these rely on misconfigurations on the part of the administrators on these servers, but they do exist out there. A lot of newer Windows uh, machines, I think Windows 11 doesn't, I don't even know if it uses Kerberos anymore. I think it might as a legacy system, but it's not its first choice. Um, and a lot of the problems that we've seen here have been patched or written over in newer versions of Windows. So not a lot of this is possible in the brand new systems, but there are tons of old systems that still exist that aren't patched and have all of these things in them. This is still a problem out there. This is a standard thing that a lot of pen testers like to try whenever they're going after Active Directory first is just to figure out have they set up Kerberos properly. So yeah, I hope everyone enjoyed that. I hope that was useful for everyone. Um, have a great night, have a great end of the semester. I know it's stressful time right now, lots of exams, finals. Um, good luck, take deep breaths, you're gonna get through it. Everything's gonna be okay, I promise you. Um, it's all gonna be fine and yeah, uh, have a good break. We'll see you back here uh, at the beginning of 2022 for more workshops uh, with the club. We'll only be doing the advanced workshops in the second semester. So yeah, hope to see you all then. Have a great night, everyone. Thanks, Jeremy. This was awesome. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you. Thanks.